Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via teleconference, and our witnesses from Solis and Nilga will also brief the committee via teleconference. The meeting will be broadcast live, and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Mm -hmm. Just to remind members to mute their tablets by pushing F4 on their machines. Um, um, apologies, we have apologies from Stuart. We also have apologies from Christopher. Um, and that is all I'm aware of so far. Um, members, that there will be only one item of business today, and is our, our oral brief from Nilga and Solis. There is a clerk's memo on page 7 of your pack. Um, papers on the briefing by Solis to the Committee for Communities at page 10, a memo from Bez, guidance to facilitate employees to return to work at page 18, and a joint briefing paper from Solis and Bilga was circulated to members yesterday evening by email and WhatsApp. Chair, I've just recirculated by email, so it should be relatively close to the top of the pile. Um, so, is everybody already on the line? I think so, but we probably should just check. Um, so I'd like to, to welcome to the meeting um, Stephen, Lisa, Suzanne and Anthony. Are you all on the line okay? Yes. Yes. Good morning. Yes, Chair. Good morning. Um, Excellent. Okay, so we have Stephen Motry, who is uh, Chair of NILGA's Economy and International Affairs Committee, um, Lisa Cain, who is Program Manager of NILGA, uh, Suzanne Wiley, who is Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, and Anthony Tohill, who is Chief Executive of Mid-Ulster Council. Um, do you want to, to make a, an opening statement and then I'll, I'll invite members to, to ask questions. Okay, uh, thank you Chair. My name is Stephen Moutry. I chair the uh, NILGA Economy and International Affairs Network, a group that brings together elected members and officers from across the 11 councils to examine and develop economic policy and practices. Uh, firstly, thank you for the invitation to address the committee at this time of crisis. NILGA and Solis are firm partners, and we have jointly developed the submitted briefing paper as shared with the Committee. We hope this will be the first in an ongoing engagement with the Committee as all layers of government work together to ensure business survival and to get our economy back on track. You will see in the paper that Councils have been at the cold face and dynamic forefront of supporting local communities in the current crisis. We have outlined a few initiatives that each Council is offering. More detail is available on the individual Council websites. You will see that regardless of the Council location and capacity, all have demonstrated their responsiveness, adaptability, innovation, flexibility and total intelligence, thereby ensuring firms have access to mentoring, advice and practical support. I would want to take this opportunity to compliment the staff in the economic development teams across the 11 councils and partner agencies who continue to work tirelessly at this time. In my own council area of Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon, our economic development unit has directly supported over 600 businesses from 12 sectors. We have realigned our resources and funding and launched the free ABC Business Support Hub to match businesses to an experienced mentor for support with topics including immediate cash flow challenges, devising short-term action plans and preparing your business for a post-coronavirus operating environment. Over 200 local business owners and self-employed people have taken part in four business webinars to date. We have also worked in partnership with the Management and Leadership Network to deliver a business summit with over 1,400 people taking part. In parallel, the Department has worked closely with councils to understand where local firms were falling through the net for grant schemes, and InvestNI has granted councils the flexibility to fine-tune existing EU-funded programmes, where the focus has shifted from growth to sustaining jobs. There is scope to do more if councils were able to draw down the EU funding to cover staff salaries, which happens in the rest of the United Kingdom. We would call on the Department to request greater flexibility from the European Commission to allow programmes to complete in a longer time period and to revise the targets set for the current programmes against the backdrop of a recession. 
The paper outlines our concerns and recommendations on how we get our economy back on track. At a time of increasing pressure on government finances, a co-designed, joined-up approach is key. The councils are exploring how they could use EU funding to jointly deliver a business recovery programme with economies of scale. And we are grateful that Invest NI has indicated its support for such an initiative. Nil Gonsoulis, as you hear now, assert that working in partnership across government, we can design an economic recovery plan that takes account of local differences, local needs, and ultimately deliver a better outcome for all. We will be meeting the department next week to begin discussions on what economic recovery will look like and to scope out what central and local government can do to contribute to this. We would go further and call for the establishment of a cross-governmental task force to agree regional investment priorities, maximise opportunities to grow our high-value sectors, identify innovative solutions and to animate our cities, town centres and villages and target recovery for critical sectors. By working together, we can achieve better outcomes, coordinate and maximise funding and offer experience and best practice and, most importantly, that local knowledge and awareness of what is happening on the ground. I want now to hand over to Solis Representative Suzanne and Anthony, but I would add that my colleague Lisa O'Kean is also available online to answer questions. Many thanks. Anthony, does one of you want to kick off there? Yeah, I think Anthony's going to start. Okay, can Anthony still there? Anthony, yeah, I'm still here. She's on the phone. Right, okay. you, were, you were going first. No, I thought you were doing some opening remarks, Anthony. Oh, well, okay. That's okay. Um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, Chair and Committee, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss the impact of coronavirus on local government and, and our local economies. Uh, prior to coronavirus, our, our economies were thriving. The issues that our businesses were facing were around access to skilled workers, addressing economic inactivity, low levels of productivity and balancing the infrastructure deficit across council areas. The thoughts of our business community were also on Brexit, uh, the challenges that that would bring and the opportunities therein. Coronavirus has fundamentally changed that. The focus is now on survival and gradual recovery of, of our businesses. A recent report by the Centre for Progressive Policy shows that many of our council areas are now economically vulnerable. My own council area, Mid Ulster, was ranked seventh most adversely impacted local authority out of 382, with their GVA expected to drop by 45% in quarter two of this financial year, which is quite a, a staggering figure. When the virus hit, uh, Council's immediate priorities were to maintain delivery of our essential services and to support our communities in their efforts to assist the vulnerable. Initially, it was also about trying to support our businesses with advice and guidance on the range of measures available to support them and to identify gaps within that support. As large organisations ourselves, we also needed to look at how to mitigate the very significant financial losses that we were facing, both in terms of loss of income and also trying to assess the impact on our rate space. Councils are extremely grateful for the support that has come from the UK Government and the Northern Ireland Assembly to our business community and also to ourselves. Um, and while we continue to work through the impact on our rate space, we are increasingly turning our focus to the recovery of our economies. We are aware that the Committee has already received deputations on the impact of coronavirus from many uh, industry representative groups and that the issues faced by our business community have been well articulated. Councils are ready and willing to work with our business community across government departments because the solutions here are not just within the providence of the um, Department for the Economy. It cuts across all government departments. We want to work with Invest NI and, and the industry representative groups in the co-design of the economic interventions that will be needed to shore up our economy in the short term to level up our economy in the medium term and to help ensure its sustainable long-term growth. One size doesn't always fit all and a place-based approach recognising sub-regional strengths and opportunities co-designed locally will yield much better results and we are ready.
to play our part here in local government. Thank you. And if I could then um, come in at Suzanne here um, and just um, put a bit of um, meat on the bones around um, all of those issues. Um, so I think we're all of the view that the burning platform of a severely damaged economy and the spotlight that is now on inequalities really creates an opportunity for Northern Ireland to address the long-running structural economic challenges such as our historically low levels of productivity, high levels of economic inactivity, low levels of investment in research and development and in infrastructure and also low levels of business survival when we compare ourselves to other regions. And we believe um, that um, we will only turn this around and achieve this if there's a cross-government approach and integration between various strategies and investment plans, um, including economic strategy, skills, energy, climate, infrastructure, etc. So I'd ask the committee to consider the role of uh, local government when it comes to the economy in three ways. Firstly, direct support to local small businesses, and secondly, opening up and reinvigorating our cities, our towns and our villages, and then thirdly, our wider role in supporting and stimulating many aspects of inclusive growth at that local and sub-regional level. So in terms of direct support for business, first of all, the focus of local government is really on small and micro businesses, enterprise, business start, business growth and social enterprise. Now that includes more than 28,000 micro businesses who employ about 20% of the Northern Ireland workforce and generate about 10 billion in sales. And they cannot directly access invest NI support, so they are dependent on local councils uh, to support them. These businesses are also um, likely to be the ones that will be most affected by lockdown and most impacted by cash flow problems because of it. So you've heard already about some of the support we're providing um, to those COVID-stricken companies, um, such as assisting them with digitising, reskilling, re-engineering re-engineering their products and services to a post-COVID environment. However, there is actually very little dedicated government money earmarked to support this work, except for what you've heard about, some very specific funding streams, mostly European um, based channel through Invest NI to local government. So we really are genuinely worried that this critical section of our economy and our workforce will struggle to survive without further support. And because of this, we intend to ask the Minister to consider a restructuring of business incentivisation and support funding. In England, for example, councils actually produce three-year local area agreements for economic development and regeneration of their areas. And a growing proportion of government funding streams is now combined in a single area-based grant. Such additional funding could also be targeted at much needed programmes such as digital investment and a range of incentives for employees and employers to incentivise retraining, reskilling and to offer employment opportunities, um, particularly uh, to uh, young people and those furthest from the labour market. Secondly, Councils are also particularly concerned about the impact of the crisis on their places, on their towns, on their villages and on their cities, as well as on local tourism, retail and hospitality, and all of those sectors fall outside INI's remit. In most town and city centres, you'll be aware that um, footfall was driven by office workers, by shoppers, by tourists, and this has fallen right through the floor. So the viability of many of these businesses is at risk if a place-based support package is not put in place to help reopen and revitalise these commercial spaces, and in particular to assist the hospitality and re retail sectors to redesign their business models. And councils are being looked to now by these businesses to support them in providing safe places and um, to provide the confidence to the public to come back and use these areas, including proposals um, like the introduction of a kite mark type accreditation scheme for these sectors. Again, in England, there has been a call to central government to provide towns and cities um, with uh, funding uh, to support local government with all of these types of initiatives. And then thirdly, it's important that we collectively strive to achieve a more regionally balanced and inclusive economy, that local government is involved as a partner in the future and not just as a stakeholder 
and is involved in co-designing and co-delivering policy, strategies, investment and support programmes. So just taking the example of city and growth deals, these demonstrate that local councils can articulate and deliver sub-regional economic strategies and programmes linked to the regional industrial strategy outcomes, but tailored to local need and opportunities and assets. It also shows that they can leverage funding from a variety of sources and blend this with their borrowing powers to create a much larger financial pot than would otherwise be available through traditional funding streams. These projects um, will be fundamental to recovery, particularly those that are focused on digital investment, on tourism, and on research and development, and, and development in our high growth sectors. We're really grateful for the match funding that was announced by the executive a few weeks ago. But we'd like to see the department incorporate these projects in their future delivery as part of their overall economic recovery strategy. And at present, it still feels too much like a funding relationship where local government is held to account for delivery rather than supporting these projects as part of a future economic strategy. In addition, councils have been developing innovative approaches to support sectoral strengths and create competitive advantage on a sub-regional basis. This includes developing partnerships, such as with the eight councils along the Belfast-Dublin Innovation Corridor and the Northwest Strategic Growth Partnership, as well as supporting smart districts, innovation zones, investing in economic infrastructure and promoting the, the incentivization of the private sector investment. Councils have also been intimately involved in developing local skills programmes, including academies and apprenticeship programmes, another area where scaling and additional investment will be critical. Many regions understand that there will also be a need for green growth stimulus as a package as part of the overall recovering plan, and councils are already working on climate change action plans and have significant contribution to make to how such a package could be designed um, as well as key areas of focus. In conclusion, we believe that co-design between central and local government with input from key business and social economy partners to an inclusive economic recovery plan would deliver better outcomes for all of government, society and industry and we welcome initial engagement with the Minister's forums, this committee and the departmental officials to this effect. Thank you. Very much for your presentations, um, and I think I, I speak for all of the, the committee members when I say that the role of councils in, in stepping up to support communities um, and continuing to deliver services over this really difficult time has been very much welcome, and the, the work of all of your staff, um, they should be commended for that as well at this time. Um, one of the, the reasons we, we wanted to, to do this engagement is because we see very much the need to have a collaborative approach um, to the, the planning for the recovery and you know economic development into the future as well. Um, and so very much welcome a lot of what you have said. Um, it's really, really useful to us. Um, if I could just pick up on, on a few things um, initially, and I'm going to then bring in members. In terms of the, the type of EU funding that you would be um, hoping to leverage, what, what specifically would you be proposing around that? I maybe take that one, uh, Sleeso Kane from Nilga. Um, so currently, uh, Invest NI has a pot of funding that it allocates to councils based on bids that the councils submit. Um, there are a number of restrictions on, on that um, funding criteria. So the, the firms must have under 50 employees. There is a sort of um, ideal of every £1,000 spent on the programme must create a job, which is obviously very difficult in any conditions, never mind in uh, coronavirus. There has been a gradual relaxation of that, but it could go further. Um, in addition, a number of the councils have been unable to, to draw down um, their full allocation of funding from that local economic development fund, and that's simply because they don't have the staff resources um, to manage the, the, the administration elements of the programme. So whereas the councils could be delivering more and could be delivering additional support, they feel they're really constrained, um, and that isn't all councils, I, sh I should say. There are a number that are in that situation. So the um, time frame for completion of the programmes, Invest NI has indicated 
that Council should have everything wrapped up by September 2022. And we think, given the flexibility that the European Commission has offered to Member States um, in delivery of their ERDF programmes, that that could maybe be pushed back to the end of 2023. Okay, thank you. It's Suzanne here, if I could come in as well. So I think it's pro the um, ask in terms of funding goes wider than just European funding. Obviously, that is what we have had so far in terms of supporting um, small business. Um, but I think what we're really saying is that the support for businesses across the board and how that is funded, um, either through European funding or through the block grant, needs to be restructured um, and there needs to be a, a sustainable support package put in place for the longer term. Uh, Chair Anthony here, just just to add as well that probably the biggest chunk of money that's going to come from Europe um, over the next few years is, is Peace Plus, and the consultation on Peace Plus happened before coronavirus, and I think there's a need to look at that again just to make sure that the the, the pillars of, of Peace Plus will deliver in the in the maximum way for for our economy, and um, you know it, it's too good an, an opportunity to miss and. and possibly the only opportunity that some areas will have to get some funding to help address the economic issues. Okay, thank you for that, that's useful. Um, John O'Dowd, I'll bring you in because I know you have to leave shortly. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yes. I can hear you. Yeah, just, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, a useful insight once again into the work of the councils at the economic uh, development and in this case economic recovery. Can I just ask, are the councils in any shape or form uh, involved in the, in the Department of Economy's strategic engagement forum, which is chaired by the Labour Relations Agency, looking at how businesses can uh, open up in the wake of the, the pandemic? Thank you. Yes, I can answer that. Suzanne here. Yes, um, John, they are. Uh, Jackie Dixon, who's the lead um, Solus representative, uh, is uh, on that engagement forum. And we're very much, uh, you know, she, she disseminates all of that information to us. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, and I suppose just to pick up on that, that, that point, in terms of the, the feeding into the engagement forum um, and the kind of ongoing work of the forum, particularly around the, the reopening, um, and you mentioned specifically the, the places, our, our cities, our towns, our villages, um, are our councils feeding into that work in terms of what is necessary to be put in place, um, both, I suppose, in the immediate term and in the longer term in terms of, of supporting um, local towns and villages, et cetera, to be able to, to work um, and to be, you know, more, I suppose, um, you know, have a, have a, a um, sustainable. Yeah, and a, a, yeah, sustainable is exactly it. Yes, it's Suzanne here again. Uh, yeah, they absolutely are. I mean, our uh, our own local businesses have been turning to us and asking us uh, for uh, our help. Um, so, for example, um, the local retailers have been asking us about, um, you know, how will councils help us put queuing systems in place? Um, they're also asking us for um, uh, a stamp of approval and um, to say that their their premises are safe to the public and. They're also helping, asking us for um, public safety campaigns and a track back campaigns um, to bring people back into the town and villages and city centres um, as well. And that's and particularly um, retail um, and hospitality. Um, and, uh, and of course, places like markets, etc. cetera, um, you know, they're asking uh, us to help them with design and layout um, for uh, those places to open safely. So councils are actively working on all of those issues at this point in time. Um, obviously, there's no um, blueprint for all of this, so this is something that um, we have been um, designing and working through with, with local stakeholders. I think that's, that's really um, insightful information. In terms of the type of like kite mark or um, you know stamp of approval, well, I suppose that would have to be in collaboration with the likes of the PHA and the HSE and, and others. Um, is that kind of the line of thinking in relation to that? 
Yeah, well, of course, we, all, we also will have, have an enforcement role under health and safety um, along with HSE and I. Uh, so uh, councils are already responsible for enforcing health and safety in uh, retail service sector businesses. Um, and, but I think if we took too much of an enforcement approach to this, um, it would take um, forever to get uh, these um, kite marks and approval schemes in place. So, um, so my view, this is a, more of a business support type um, approach, and will have to be ruled out very quickly. And we'll, you know, we'll need help and support um, uh, across um, the various services of, of councils to enable that to happen. So I wouldn't say it just as enforcement officers uh, undertaking that role. I would say it as, as much wider than that. Um, Chair Anthony here, if I could just add, um, it's great to have the advice and guidance um, for retail, but there's also a cost of putting these measures in place, and um, I'm sure, as, as all members are aware, many of our um, high streets are, are old buildings that not necessarily haven't been adapted to modern standards, uh, and I mean, there is a real need for an uplift in the, the interventions for, for town centres, and I know that the urban regeneration doesn't necessarily sit with this committee, but um, it's, it's a really, really significant issue if, if we're going to ask our, our retail sector, which is, has been struggling greatly before coronavirus, to, to, you know, to make it ad adaptations to their premises, to, to introduce measures to, to help us control um, the spread of coronavirus, that, that they need support. And it, it was interesting that in December 2019 that, that, that the English government issued a £1 billion funding package for high streets. Um, and they had a high street task force to, to, to help and advise government on that. And that was before coronavirus even came to these shores. So it's really, really important that, that our town centre retail is supported. And, and um, the measures that have gone and put into place so far have been really, really beneficial. There's a couple of gaps in that. One of those gaps, you know, if, if you're an indigenous company that has, um, say, shops in different towns, you can only access the, the £25,000 business grant once. You don't get it for each of your shops. So that there is a wee bit of an issue in around that, but there is a need for, for further thought to be given to how we support our town centre retail premises um, to be ready to, to embrace the guidance that, that they're now being asked to, to run their, their businesses by. And just one other thing I would add, um, and um, totally agree with Anthony, that that is absolutely essential, that there is a funding package put in place, because we're going to have to reimagine our towns and city centres, we're going to have to reanimate um, uh, those areas as well, we're going to have to do public campaigns around them, but we're going to have to help businesses like retail and hospitality completely reimagine their business models in future too, and that's going to take um, considerable resource time and, and effort. Chair, can I just... Yeah, go ahead. A comment? Thank you. Uh, Steve, Stephen here again. Can I just say, you know, across our borough, for example, there are so many small retail businesses that are employing between one and ten people, and they're not part of big chain groups. And, you know, the, the, the owners there need help in the very basics in relation to screening, in relation to marking out and stuff like that, and council are best placed to give this help. And there's a role there, not only for economic development, but across, across the departments in relation to environmental health as well, not to enforce, but to work with retailers in, this un in these unprecedented times and help them to get through it. I think that, that's a consistent message that the committee has been getting um, from, from retail and that we have been feeding in, so I think that, that we will do that again. Um, Claire, are you still on the line okay? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I suppose um, the necessity of moving forward is that we have an effective recovery just to help as many businesses um, as possible and, and, and the wider community. Um, I suppose that I would ask um, for some constructive criticism of where um, maybe the Northern Ireland Executive hasn't supported uh, local councils, um, and I'm thinking around the lines of maybe communications um, and how you know they could improve um, how they do this and the delays on they have with local government to ensure that anything moving forward um, is as effective as it can be. I'm thinking particularly in relation to some of the legal advice that was probably required in relation to open the civic amenity sites. Um, or some of the other areas, and I think there will still be some of those conversations that need to be had, but it needs to be, I, from my perspective anyway, I believe it needs to be consistent right across Northern Ireland, 
and that needs to come from direction from the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, and we're still seeing that local councils are implementing um, their own view on things, which is fine because that is their um, remit to do so. But I, I think moving forward, we need to be more consistent. And if, if you were to, you know, able to um, ask how the Northern Ireland Executive could better support local councils in being able to do that. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, Claire, that's um, quite, a, quite a difficult question for us as officers within uh, local government to, uh, to to comment on in terms of... Uh, I think we, we have to recognise that um, what everyone is dealing with at the minute is absolutely unprecedented, and no one had a plan sitting on the shelf um, to to get us all through this in, in terms of how we, how we deal with it, and um, I think everyone is, is doing the best that they can, and where there's been issues around probably around communication and, and where you know we, we have to respect the um, decision making mechanisms within within the executive and it's not always possible for the executive indeed it's, it's not possible when, when matters of, of confidential nature have been discussed at executive level for us to be given the heads up um, on that uh, so that we can we can make our preparations and be able to respond um, probably more quickly and more collectively um, but it, it, it is really difficult the issue where there has been issues we have we have raised them we have um, obviously uh, channels into, into all of the, the officer decision making structures so we're, we're all are, are doing our best and I'm sure that sometime in the future there will be an analysis of, of how everyone has responded and, and maybe that criticism is, 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 is for another day but where we have issues we're raising them and I think it to be fair to those that, that are on the other side that they are listening to our concerns and trying to work with us as, as best as possible. I think um, you've heard the word co-design used quite a few times by all three of us um, making the presentations. And I think, you know, the example of the opening up plan um, for um, cities, towns and, and villages um, is a very good one. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, because um, we will have to be totally involved with um, central government colleagues in how this happens um, rather than it just being told it's going to happen um, on this date, that date or the other date um, uh, because there is so much pre-work that needs to happen to allow that to, to work really effectively and so there's there's not organised um, chaos. So for me it's about how we co-design those opening up strategies with central government and how we get the right communication to the public around all of that. Yeah, um, I, I agree, and it's you know I, I'm not looking for anyone to criticise on the basis you know that this was an unprecedented situ situation. I, th I think we all recognise that is the case, um, but I also recognise that local government um, are key stakeholders within yeah. any sort of uh, uh, government plan that you know that would happen, whether it's unprecedented or not. So I would like to think that, that engagement already exists. And you know we uh, seek to improve that, and, and I, th I think it is, you know, Suzanne, you're right. It is very much about co-design, but certainly from my perspective, as a representative of constituents have come, who have come to me about issues in relation to local government, I want to understand how I can encourage the Northern Ireland Executive to better support local government so that these difficulties don't happen moving forward. Because I said at the outset, recovery is really. Uh, uh, critical that we do it in the most efficient way possible. So I, I'm not necessarily looking, you know, to, to be uh, slinging mud here. I'm looking for opportunities to try and improve what we have done and use the experience of the last two months to do that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I completely agree um, with, um, you know, your aspirations there. Uh, absolutely, because um, it still feels. Um, a bit to me that um, you know the decisions are made and then local government is kind of catch, catching up um, and putting plans in place, um, uh, you know, nearly after the fact, um, as opposed to, to co-designing. So I think um, you know they they ask from Solas and and from Nilga would be that we're involved um, in a much more integrated way at a much earlier stage. Okay, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to echo uh, the Chair's words in terms of our thanks, uh, obviously, to Nilga, Solis and all of the uh, Council staff at every level, uh, whether it be the cleaner to the Chief Executive, I think that everybody uh, within the uh, organisations deserve uh, praise and thanks for, for what they've done in these uh, difficult times. Uh, it's just a follow-on from the engagement piece, um, and I appreciate that you have 
give some comment in respect of the engagement forum and, and how you feed into that. Uh, but it's quite evident from uh, your contributions today that there still are some frustrations around uh, how councils have been informed um, prior to decisions been taken. One example being the recycling centres, uh, because I know that some councils uh, opened earlier than others. Uh, some have taken different approaches as to how they operate them now that they are open. And I think that that lack of consistency is indeed a problem uh, for ourselves as elected representatives because uh, when you go into a different area uh, and a constituent speaks to another from another area um, and there's not the same approach it causes a problem but I suppose that that's one thing but when it comes to reopening uh, businesses uh, it becomes a much more serious matter and I think that that's something that we need to address. I maybe just want to tease out the, the issue around the cross uh, governmental task force that was mentioned there by, by Stephen. Um, could you give us more information in terms of how you see that, how you see that working? Um, you know, how, how uh, that would differentiate from the engagement forum, for example. Um, thank you, Stephen. So, um, at the moment, there is an economic advisory group um, which the government is not represented on, and there's a tourism recovery steering group which we are represented on. So, we would like to see that uh, local government could have a place at the table on that economic advisory group, maybe with a task force underneath that draws together um, sectors of government departments um, that really looks at how we prioritise our key sectors key sectors, looks at our um, developing regional and sub-regional investment priorities, that we look at how we can maximise uh, key sectors and innovative solutions around skilling, and to make sure that recovery is um, targeted for those sectors who are maybe not expected to recover well. Um, we, we feel that that um, task force must have a place and that it should understand that the councils have their own plans for local economic recovery whether that be their local development plans, their cross-border plans, um, the Belfast region that was uh, uh, mentioned earlier, so the, the work with to develop the Dublin-Belfast Economic Corridor, all of those are important plans and aspirations of the councils that we feel could be better, uh, better outcomes could be achieved if there's a task force between central and local government to uh, address all of these. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, sorry, Chair Anthony here. Just if I could come in on the back of Lisa's comments. I, I think the, the initial um, engagement forum was, was set up uh, at a time when the focus was very much on the area of, of key workers and essential businesses. And a lot of that effort was, was even around identifying what is, who, the list of key workers and key businesses. So I think there's a little bit of a gap there in terms of advice and guidance that now can be used for other sectors that are, are, are putting plans in place to reopen. So, so maybe the, the, the work of that forum, while it was, was really good initially, the, the, there's a bit more to be done there, I think. Thanks, Chair. That's very useful. Obviously, we'll no doubt take that up uh, at the end of the meeting. Uh, the one further point that I was just going to make is that uh, councils, uh, I know from my own experience, uh, you know, people see it as a one-stop shop, so uh, people will blame councils really for anything <laughs> that's, that's going. And, uh, and, and I know that... We're well used to that. <laughs> and that's sort of fair. Even as elected representatives, we say we'll speak to the local council. Uh, but we know that, that you know, the, the staff there are, are uh, fantastic, and we know that at the same time that financial support needs to come along with that, and that, I suppose, is my next question, is around the, the financial pressures that, that the councils are under. Uh, do you feel that, at this minute in time, that you're, you're, you're been listened to? Um, and I know that, that that's part of the frustration sometimes, is, is almost that you know, you're told uh, what you'll be getting, as opposed to actually having an input as to uh, maybe what specific support that you need. So uh, do you f feel that that's working? Uh, and, and is there something maybe that we as a committee can do with the limited, I suppose, remit that we would have in, in the councils? Um, I think uh, that, um, first of all, that there isn't the full understanding of what local government's 
um, role in terms of economic development actually is and how broad that is, um, and specifically in terms of COVID recovery now as well. So um, some sectors will look at local government um, and will think, um, oh, it's just about delivery of the local eco economic development the LED programs for small business, um, but it's actually much, much wider than, than that. Um, and you can see councils are involved in research and development, um, innovation projects, for example, and um, they're involved in investment in infrastructure projects as well um, to improve the economy and regeneration projects to improve the economy. Um, so it is incredibly wide. And I think um, first and foremost, um, there there isn't that broad understanding of what local government does um, and how it can contribute. So uh, that needs to be fixed. In terms of actual finance, um, uh, certainly there isn't sufficient finance to help the small and micro businesses recover. Um, at this point in time, um, funding packages are being put in place through Invest NI, but primarily for their clients um, and, and not um, for the, the, the small businesses out there, which employ so many of our population. Um, I also think um, that in terms of what we've already talked about, in terms of places like towns and cities and villages, there needs to be a funding package put in place um, for, for those um, as well. Um, and of course, then when it comes to um, uh, you know, large investment programs, um, whether that's reskilling programs, um, which we absolutely need to do um, at pace, and which councils also um, have a role in in providing employment academies, um, etc., or whether that's investment in terms of um, digital infrastructure rollout, like Project Stratum. Um, these things are really important for our future recovery. Thanks, Gary. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks everyone for your presentation. And first of all, I should say my son is a local councillor, so I declare an interest there. He's a member of Ards and North Downborough Council. And uh, again, we would reiterate the good work that the councils have done, especially over the, the recent, uh, during the recent crisis, and the, the work you've done in supporting the Department of Communities, I think has been really good and very much appreciated by our constituents on the ground. So we do appreciate the work of the councils. I suppose the points have been fairly well covered. The whole issue of regeneration and building businesses is, is something the councils were keen to get involved in, but I think there's still that gap there in relation to funding. So um, I think you've given us that message fairly clear, and perhaps someone can add to that. But um, we want to see uh, you know, further growth being developed through councils. We are very much aware of the good work that has been done and the work you've done as well on the grants, helping local businesses uh, through your centres and, and uh, your work support uh, programmes that you put in place. It's all very much appreciated. But the funding is a big issue. And I've been a former member of a council myself, I'm very much aware of the... There's always been this genuine drive to try and regenerate our town centres and build businesses locally, but we've never had the funding to do it. And I think that's uh, something, I suppose, you want to portray to us that we need to help to close that gap. And um, certainly at MLA level, we sometimes are lacking, I think, the information directly from the council on what is needed and what, what is required within our local areas. So we do welcome the, uh, the grow in this um, uh, presentation here today, and I hope it's an ongoing process. And those are the main issues. Our town centres are important. They're dead at the moment. We need to get them fired up. And I. I note that the points made about um, re regenerating them, refreshing them, I think, is important, and trying to make them more attractive and getting people in again into them to browse, even to shop, to build confidence, I think, are all important issues. So perhaps you could give us some more further comments on how you can see uh, further economic development and how we can help to regenerate our town centres. Thank you, everybody. Um, Chair, Chair Anthony, I, I think that's a really, really important issue for all of us and in, in, the, in the time we have, we're probably not going to be able to do that justice and maybe if the committee was, was willing to give us a bit more time to and make a submission to the committee in terms of town centre regeneration and what local government feels is, is required, um, that might be uh, if the member was okay with that. Yep, there's there's yep. obviously, um, Suzanne mentioned the, the growth deal opportunities and 
and um, the, the Stormont uh, executive announced £100 million of additional funding for um, areas outside the, the North West. So there's, there's an opportunity in there in, in terms of councils working um, together collectively to, to come up with some ideas and initiatives around um, how that money might be able to use to stimulate our, our, our town centres. And I think as we move into economic re recovery, um, certainly to get the construction sector back up and going, there, there's a need for government to invest, uh, whether that be in our strategic road um, infrastructure or, or in other um, public sector construction projects. So, so if, if, if you're OK with that, um, members will, will do a bit more work and get something, get something into the committee. That would be very useful. Brian, thanks very much. Sinead? Okay. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for your presentation. It was uh, excellent. And, and to be honest, we've had uh, a number of presentations over the past few weeks from various business bodies and uh, stakeholders uh, and partners. Um, uh, and they've all brought solutions to this committee. And, and that has been uh, a point of, of welcome for all of us here. So, so thank you again. And in many ways, um, I would say that... Um, that that our local authorities and local governments are the lead uh, in this uh, particular um, crisis because you are at the cold front. You are there trying to get practical solutions uh, on a daily basis. So rather than seeing you as a stakeholder, you're fundamental to us actually getting into recovery. So we have to work together. Uh, and uh, and as well, you know, this this executive and this assembly was down for three years. The only leadership that we had within Northern Ireland was our local government. They stepped up then, and they've stepped up now. So we we must continue that and make sure that the collaboration. Uh, 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 and the coherent uh, recovery plan that we need for Northern Ireland is, is very much done in unison with the local authority and the central government as well and the national government. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I mean, I, I bring up probably every time I come to committee now is that we are going to have a, a problem with unemployment within all of our, within all of our regions, within all of our uh, local authorities, and we have to find ways of, of getting solutions uh, to this, particularly for our young people. And, and Suzanne, you mentioned that about academies and apprenticeships and about needing a growth strategy for those particular interventions in order to get people into work uh, and valuable work and paid work that is going to actually see uh, Northern Ireland prospering, is it going to drive up our productivity, is going to uh, deal with some of the, the uh, areas of, of, of where we've got, um, I suppose, uh, per infrastructure, etc, etc. Have, you know, I know there's some ideas within the city deals uh, and that, mm -hmm. but there has to be additional, additionality to that um, now based on the current crisis uh, and, and how we protect um, our economies. Have you any ideas? Now, and, and that equally to you, Anthony, you know, particularly Mid-Ulster, where, where we, we have a lot of our engineering businesses that, that will require support. A lot of them are very small, but very, very uh, productive. Yeah, I... Um, certainly, um, the, that you're absolutely right, um, and particularly um, young people um, in the future and um, not even being able to get employment, never mind being made um, unemployed. Um, so I think what um, the beauty of councils um, and their role being so locally focused is that they can see the match um, between um, you know, uh, the potential for jobs of the future um, the skills that currently exist in their local workforce and the surround in their local labour market and their surrounding area, um, and they can see where potential investment um, is going to come from and where investment deficits are, um, and they can um, can very um, easily uh, look at um, what skills are going to be needed um, for the future and and are helping already to start thinking about a re reskilling programmes um, at pace, but that's going to need more investment has been mentioned before and of course digital skills are going to be absolutely key and COVID has just accelerated the need for digital skills um, inordinately uh, and so um, you know I, I initially um, certainly um, a, a huge digital skills program um, could be put in place which would um, help uh, to, cre to create the skills for the jobs that are going to be needed in the very, very near future. And also, when you think about some of the work that we're doing um, with City Deals on 
innovation hubs around our growth sectors um, as well and skilling the, the um, workforce of the future um, to uh, take up the jobs in those sectors, whether that's green and media, whether that's advanced manufacturing in the future, whether that's health analytics and health diagnostics, for example. Um, Chair Anthony, if I could just, just come in on, on the back of that, um, just, just to mention apprenticeships and the, the importance that you know, apprenticeships um, uh, the role they have within, with, certainly within a lot of our rural economies and in our manufacturing sectors, that um, it, we still have a tension between the balance of, of young people that are going into um, academia against those that are going into you know, um, the apprenticeship route, and um, a tension, I suppose, competition between schools and colleges, colleges and universities for, for, for places. You know, everyone's fighting for their own sustainability and, and there probably needs to be a, a piece of work done and around how our whole education and, and training system delivers for the economy. Um, we, and, and certainly in Mid-Ulster and the Mid-Southwest, um, a lot of our companies rely very heavily on that apprenticeship model. And, um, and I know there's some concerns around when we, we hit a, a new academic year, um, there's a need to protect the apprenticeships that are already in place um, and that, that to make sure that the supply line of, of the next um, cohort of, of skilled workers are coming through and, and also a need for, for greater flexibility with employers because uh, you know the current model might not service going forward uh, where an employer is expected to, to employ maybe for four days a week and, and, and the apprentice goes to the college for one day a week, that might not be the right model. The employers might need to, might be able to afford to employ the, the, the apprentice for, for four days of the week. So there's, there's a huge issue around that. It's really, really important to our economy. Um, the issues around access to the, the uh, monies that are taken from companies under the apprenticeship levy, that's a real bone of contention that, that our companies can't access that money. So. Um, just, just if the, if the committee can be mindful of, of the importance of, of, of high-level apprenticeships to, to our economy, and particularly in the manufacturing sector. Just and if I could just ask one, add one other thing. Um, the design of the Future Shared Prosperity Fund is going to be absolutely critical to ensuring that there is sufficient funding um, for skills programmes in the future. Um, so if you think about that's a replacement for some of the ESF um, skills uh, programmes. Um, however, that hasn't yet, as far as I know, been fully sought through here in Northern Ireland. So there's an opportunity um, to do that. And for again, for local government, um, to be part of how that's designed, but also how it's delivered and implemented. Thank you both for that. And uh, yes, the Shared Prosperity Fund is really important, and, and, and it would be helpful if we could put some shape in that, because we are looking at um, having to restructure our funding in this area, and I think we need to look at the restructure of funding around apprenticeship. It's not only the apprentices that need support at this time, it's also the employers that are going to uh, take on those apprentices uh, and to make sure that we can deliver for our, for our future. Um, and it's worrying that our EU funding um, has, a, has a finite line. So we really need to, to, to see what the new future looks like in relation to um, that funding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gary, you want to come back in? Thanks, Chair. And it's just very briefly, and was remiss of me not to mention it. Um, I want to talk about staff at councils. Uh, obviously, um, you know, we, we do speak with staff uh, who we, we represent within our constituencies and we work for local councils, and many of them obviously are concerned about uh, their own positions. We know that most councils, if not all now at this point, have furloughed staff. Um, some of them have been treated differently than others. Some councils have taken the decision to uh, pay the additional 20%. Others have, have uh, decided not to do that. And that's a matter, of course, for each council to decide what best suits them and, and their current position. But as we go forward, and we know that there's a lack of income in terms of our leisure facilities and, and other income streams, which it will take some time to rebuild that capacity again. Uh, how, uh, through your own organisations, are you working with staff and reassuring them that, look, you know, everything that has been done, um, uh, everything that can be done uh, is being done to ensure that we can protect your, protect your jobs, but also that, um, you know, that, that's been fed through to uh, the Assembly here and to the UK government as well? Well, I think that's a really important point. Um, obviously, um, you know, we as councils um, have to do everything in our power to try and protect um, the, the jobs um, 
uh, of the people we employ. Um, given the role that we're saying that we um, want to provide um, for the future, particularly in economic recovery, um, so it is really important. Now, as you know, councils are facing. Um, uh, reduced income, a significant reduced income, and um, uh, fortunately, um, the Department for, for Communities um, did announce the £20 million um, funding package to help um, with um, supplementing some of that um, reduced income, um, but just for the first three months, so um, up until the end of June. So, and we will still have issues beyond um, June. We have also asked um, the um, Department for Finance, however, um, to um, secure the um, budget estimates through the rates um, process for this year and also for the next two years. And that's very similar to councils in, in England um, who have asked for a three-year funding package um, to be guaranteed and, and secured for, for local governments going forward so that they have um, that um, ability to plan um, for the future. And I think if those packages come forward and also councils um, do make efficiencies because we do have to, um, we do have to reduce reduce our costs, um, then we can secure um, those jobs. Thanks for that, and I think that um, you know today, as rate bills uh, start arriving, no doubt rate payers within our constituencies will be uh, they'll obviously be thinking in their minds, will be thinking in terms of next year as to what's to come down the line. Um, and I think that we need to do everything we can ensure that absolutely right. Maybe uh, whilst the, the funding is going to be tight, I think we need to then take this as an opportunity to radically do things differently. Uh, and if that means, and I, some would say, well, it's not that radical to look at three-year budgets, but you know for this assembly it's something that I think we really need to look at particularly given the challenges so no thanks for that much appreciated thank you thank you um, thank you very much for your your presentations and your contributions this morning um, I think that the, the paper that you have provided to us has been really useful um, and highlights a, a, an important number of themes around the role of councils um, particularly in tackling regional imbalances and um, generating inclusive growth all of that stuff around skills and apprenticeships we will take up we have reached out to fe colleges and training providers uh, around those issues specifically that you were highlighting there anthony in terms of uh, those in, in the middle of apprenticeships at the minute and, and what's going to happen in, in relation to the incoming year um, I think it would be very useful if you would be able to provide us with a submission around um, the, the towns and cities and villages and the reopening strategy. That would be really useful and, very, and um, we would be very welcoming of that. Um, we will also take up the points in relation to the economic advisory group. I think the engagement forum has been a, a really useful platform um, for engagement and for collaborative working and, and I think there's very much for a role for that into the future and we need to um, address what you know the remit of that would be. Um, and in relation to the points around Invest NI, that's something that we should we will also take up um, in terms of their remit um, in this um, under the, the circumstances that we're facing at the minute um, and in terms of how we support um, all businesses across the, the north, including our, our micro businesses, um, who, like you say, have such a key role in our, our local economy. Um, I, I think, unless anybody has anything additional to add. Um, um, Chair, it's Lisa from Nilgo. Maybe just make some closing remarks. Stephen has unfortunately been called away. Um, so really just in closing, you've heard from Nilga and Solis today that it's time for a transformation in how central and local government interact to sustain and grow our economy. We now have a chance to develop a locally driven one public purse approach which promotes sustainable development, addresses economic inactivity and skills gaps, embeds entrepreneurship and supports a new green deal and innovation. We have jointly set out the constraints local councils are facing, as well as our recommendations to support business, provide leadership and coordination, and to work in partnership with co-design with all layers of government. We would hope that a task force can be established promptly so we can co-design plans and initiatives to get our economy back on track. And in closing, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to talk to you this morning, and we look forward to regular engagements in the future. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I think that those points are, are very well made about how we need to be much more joined up in how we approach things and also in terms of, of looking for more sustainable growth into the future, including um, and in terms of the green recovery. So those points are, are um, will be very much taken on board. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's very useful. Chair, if it's helpful, um, it might be useful for me to process this um, and also talk to Lisa again about, there were some really great phrases in that closing statement that I'd like to get my hands on, um, but also a, a wider submission from Nilga and Solis about their plan. It's certainly... Um, clear that there's a lot of coordination going on across the councils and there was a lot of ideas there about how to leverage that into centrally held funds in potentially looking at invest ni's um operational model going forward there's there's a lot of suggestion around how that probably needs to change because fdi is going to be different and and, and maybe more complicated to get going forward as well and there has been a lot of input from sectors, industries and so on to the committee so far about um, localisation mm -hmm. and growing indigenous um, businesses, social enterprise and so on. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah. So if I gather and process and then we use Thursday morning triage, we can bring in then what we hear tomorrow yeah. in our other meeting this week. Uh, through the chair, I think that there has been a lot of coordination with the local authorities, but what I've heard is that they feel disconnected here. And, and one of the words they said that they're not a stakeholder, they're actually a partner and they're a delivery partner. Um, and, and I suppose in many ways, because of COVID, is so local. You know, mm -hmm. they are the main delivery partner. We're the ones here that are we but a step away because uh, just it's place based and it's. It's all of that, and I think that there's a lot of a, a lot of material there, and probably it m may mean that we, as a committee, should actually um, even even do something like um, a day out with you know when things become, <laughs> no, but a day out with 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 um, the group, the Solus group, so that we can maybe talk through things in more detail, um, because there's a lot of work that we could be doing from a committee to bridge that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, Chair, no, no, I, I completely agree with what Sinead's saying. I think the difficulty being, and even for ourselves, is knowing um, e exactly the remits of uh, the Department for the Economy and you know where that sits in terms of the councils, because by the sounds of it, and I do take Sinead's absolutely right, is that what it sounds like is they are coordinated among their themselves, but you know it's not even that they're consulted. It's almost as if they're told, look, you know, you're not able to open as opposed to uh, how do you see that we can mm -hmm. open? And, and I think it's almost, it is a bit disrespectful, but uh, you know, I don't, I'm not suggesting that any particular individuals be disrespectful. I just think it's terms of, uh, it's how we're set up here. But I would worry that, uh, and there, there's talk of a cross sort of, what was it, cross governmental task force. There does need to be something to link departments together because I know that even, you know, I was venturing into, you know, council's funding in terms of, you know, and that, that sits with BFC, uh, but at the same time, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely relevant to us in terms mm -hmm. of the economy. Oh, absolutely. This is probably where the idea of an outcomes-based um, cross-cutting programme for government really actually is worthwhile. Um, and that's something, Chair, that certainly I haven't heard anything being flagged up about what is happening with Programme for Government because it's the ideal forum to, to yeah. do this and bringing in councils on top as a partner. You know, the, the co-design word was used a lot there. Uh, through the Chair, you know, every single one of those councils have got a community plan. It's very strategic, it's very focused. And what we're not getting, like, where our problem here is that we're not really connected into them and our program for government we are in in various ways in various departments but there's no that coherence around it uh, and if we're going into recovery and it's not going to be it's a new normal um we we've got to work together in tandem chair if you look just picking up on that if you look at um community plans mm -hmm. councils link to what program for government is doing or, or departmental funds and so on and that traffic you get the impression that traffic is one way 
that um, that really now needs to be dialogue rather than, as, as Mr Middleton said, just here you go, you're opening tomorrow. You know, there's some guidance. It's building. Mm. And that, that's, that's, you know, flippant and, and, and mm. facetious, but that's a very strong message, is, is folding community planning into a, a, a dialogue with government around the, the programme for government, where it's not just flowing down, it's flowing back. In many ways, these community plans were there when we had no government. So they became the plan because there was no programme for government. So they, they didn't have to connect in with anything, really, because it wasn't there. There was that vacuum. And I know from, from Derry City and Straban, I mean, our plan was completed during that vacuum piece. So, um, you know, they led the way in terms of, of sub-regional development, and I'm sure it happened right across uh, the north here. So, you know, there's a lot of work that we have to do, I suppose, as a committee to kind of pull our piece into it. Chair, what springs to mind, and we've had it from some of the briefing previously, um, before the crisis even, um, <coughs> around some of the language and terminology where stakeholder mm -hmm. is used. That, that group is a stakeholder group as part of the community planning process. And when the committee has dug down into that, they've realised that at best that's observer status, that it's not <laughs> part of a dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we've heard that talk again and again from sectors, industries, representative groups about a new way of doing things. And it, it, it does seem that the programme for government, linking directly with councils and their community planning, is probably one of the best ways to do that. And even you know wider, wider than that, um, in NDNA, there was a commitment around civic engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to bring that um, into the conversation as well when mm -hmm. we talk about what the, the recovery looks like into the future. So I think there is a lot of uh, food for thought there around how we um, can better coordinate things mm -hmm. because it, I think very much our, our local government has to be like an integral part of what we do and not just as as you say a stakeholder as such you know it has to be part of how we, mm -hmm. we make the design not phrase yeah, well chair I'll gather up process and we can triage this on Thursday along with what comes out of tomorrow's meeting okay as uh, we are meeting again tomorrow yes. just are we <laughs> yes normal Wednesday meeting on the Wednesday don't meeting. Else, no, we've yeah, saved all other business till tomorrow. Any other um, What's on tomorrow then, Peter? So, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> 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 yes. And fintech. Two. And fintech. fintech. Um, members will recall that we had a fintech week at the end of last yes. month. Mm. And yeah. there's a role there to be played in. Um, a lot of investment, a lot of jobs coming in recently yes. around fintech, oh, and it's how you use that in recovery. recovery. Yeah. Alongside digital, um, fintech kind of merges digital mm -hmm. and the finance economy. Yeah. That probably doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It merges those two. So when you get the digital, the fintech follows naturally, and there are a lot of global jobs in that. Mm -hmm. It's one of the sectors where um, there's been a lot of local success in bringing in that kind of function from global companies because here's a good place to do it because we have the workforce we have the qualifications we have the skills and it's widening that out and it's a great um sector to start looking at trying to bring young people in at every different level so there's a you know there's an academic degree based route but there's also higher diplomas, there's higher apprenticeships and so on that can fold all into that. So it, hopefully that's what we're going to get some sense of tomorrow. So it's still COVID-19 related, yeah. but it's just trying to push towards that recovery. kind of recovery. Gary, I was... Oh, sorry, we're still, still, we're still yes, but um, we, so, we can So um, I'll just move then to the date, time and place of the next meeting, which is tomorrow morning here in this room 30. Room. Thank you. At Members. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.